Amen. How many of you, Sunday the favorite day of your week, or is it just me? Anyone else, favorite day of the week? Amen. I'm excited you guys are here. It's Palm Sunday today. For those of you who don't know what Palm Sunday is, it's the last week of Jesus. It's, it's it, you know, it, leading all the way up to Resurrection Sunday. And so um, on all of our social media platforms, if you want to join us for like devotion and kind of your own morning devotion to lead yourself all the way through Easter Sunday, we are releasing every morning a Holy Week devotion. So every day in the life of Jesus, the last seven days, just some reflection, some scripture, some prayer about that day and its meaning and focus. So you can join us on any of our social media platforms all the way leading up to Easter Sunday. Uh, we're in the last installment today, though, of First John. How many of you have enjoyed this series, First John, the verse-by-verse -verse study? Been good? If you've missed any of them, you know where they're at. They're online, on YouTube. But we are concluding it today, and we got a lot of scriptures to cover because we're going to finish uh, chapter 4 and go through all of chapter 5. But I know I'm in a place where people love the Bible, right? Am I in the right place? You got people that love the Bible up in here. Okay, here's the title of today's uh, sermon is Walk in Victory. Someone shout victory. victory. This is that, Now look, this is what John is going to tell us and how he's going to teach us to walk in victory. It's the culmination, really, of everything we've learned up till now. It's, it's walking in truth, walking in light, walking in love. And when we do that, that culminates in this victorious living to walk in victory. And as I was studying this walk that God has called us to walk in, this victorious living, and, and what John's going to teach us today, I was reminded of the speech by Winston Churchill when he, when in his inaugural speech as prime minister during World War II, um, and they were like, you know, it's a seemingly invincible enemy of Nazi Germany. He kind of inspired um, Britain and, and many others, the Allies, to keep fighting against this enemy called Nazi Germany. I wanted to read a little bit of it for you because it just, it, there's so many connections, like spiritual parallels to his speech, and I'm not saying that Winston Churchill's a prophet or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying here, but I, I just think that it's, it is powerful, and there are some parallels, and I'd love for you to hear kind of a little bit of this speech today. You didn't know you are going to get some history today, but here you go. Here's a little bit of history for you, okay? He says this, I say to this house, as I said to ministers who have joined this government, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. We have before us an ordeal of the most grievous kind. We have before us many, many months of struggle and suffering. You ask, what is our policy? I say it is to wage war by land, sea, and air. War with all our might and with all the strength God has given us. And to wage war against a monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the dark and lamentable catalog of human crime. This is our policy. You ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word. It is victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terrors. Victory, however long and hard the road may be, for without victory, there is no survival. It was this speech that kind of just motivated and inspired all the allies and many others like it to continue fighting against this seemingly invincible enemy. And, and where there's so many parallels, but some of the parallels are this, is that we are still in a war today. Whether you realize this or not, there is a spiritual battle at stake. And, and where maybe this differs is is Winston Churchill was telling them to fight for victory, but as followers of Jesus, we don't fight for victory, we fight from victory. And the enemy that we're fighting is not any enemy of flesh and blood. The enemy that we're fighting are actually three that are named all throughout John's letter, and he's going to kind of cover them a little bit more today in our reading. Three enemies are our spiritual enemies, three. It's the world, the flesh, and the devil. Those are the three enemies that we have. The forces of evil against us, it's, it's the world, it's the flesh, and the devil. And every time we lose the battle on any of those battle fronts, the world, the flesh, and the devil, it's called sin. That's what losing the battle is. It's, it's sin. Now sin, as I told you a few weeks ago, is simply missing the mark. But what mark is that? What mark are we missing? The mark that we miss is the will of God. That's what sin is. It's the miss. The will of God. So, so think of it like this. Sin is when we get out from under the will of God. We, we remove ourselves from the will of God and we do the will of the flesh. It's, it's removing ourselves from the will of God and doing the will of the world. Removing ourselves from the will of, of God and doing the scheme and the evil trap of the enemy. That's what this is. This is the victory that we're called to, to walk in. 
walking in the victory of, of our flesh, of our world, and of the devil. First John chapter 4, verse 17, it begins and he says, And as we live in God, we, our, our love grows more perfect. That word perfect, in some of your Bible translation, it's, it's the word complete or more complete. And John uses this word in this last couple of chapters very often. He says, as we live in God, this love, and by the way, this love is the agape love. It's not the love that you and I can manifest in and of ourselves. It's not the erotic love. It's not the family love. It's not the brotherly kindness kind of love. This is the unconditional, unstoppable love of God. That as we live in God, what is being made perfect and developed and completed inside of us is the agape, unconditional, unstoppable love of God. And it's so easy for us as Christians and followers of Christ to become so fragmented in our faith where we get focused and fixated on one aspect of our faith instead of the main aspect of our faith. We get so fixated on just one. Maybe for some of you, you get so fixated and emphasize on worship. Oh, worship. We should all encounter God and leave people to encounter God, a real God. And amen, I believe that. But then we get so, some of you stress the sound doctrine and the word of God and men do we need to know and we need to study and we need to dig ourselves in and what you need to know is all those all those emphasis they're just byproducts of us living in God and love being perfected in us it's not the main thing the main thing for the child of God is love unconditional unstoppable love that was to be developed inside of us as we live in God this is the victory that John calls us to walk in now here's the good news if you're a child of God, you have victory. It's yours. The victory is already yours. But the question today is, you have the victory, but are you walking in it? Are you walking in victory? And then, and, and then what does that look like? And here we're John again. He's so, he's so um, decisive. He wants to reveal. He says, this is how it's manifested or revealed. If you're walking in victory, it shows up in your life. So here's the final test that John is going to give us, the final contrast that he's given us. If you are, not only have victory, but if you're walking in victory, it's revealed in your life. It shows up in your life in certain ways, in very specific ways. Y'all ready to take some notes with me? All right. Okay, what does it show up in? How is it revealed if we're walking in victory? Number one, it's revealed like this. I have confidence in place of fear confidence in place of fear. John uses this word often in this section as well, confidence. You know what it means? I love this. It means free and fearless. How many want to live free and fearless in here? This is what it means to walk in victory. It means a life of freedom, a life of fearlessness. Let's look at it in 1 John chapter 4. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. Now, no one is exactly like Jesus, but here's what John is saying. The, that just as Jesus was not of this world, child of God, neither of you. You're not of this world. Jesus was not of this world. He came from a whole other world. He came from heaven. So you, child of God, you are like Jesus. You do not belong to this world. And then he continues. There is no fear in love. Somebody say no fear. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. Some of your translations actually say torment. This, this fear has to do with torment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love or not been complete in love. Verse 19, we love. We, we have this unconditional, unstoppable love because we have received an unconditional, unstoppable love from God. Here's the sad reality. Unfortunately, there's so many believers. They, they believe in Jesus, yet they are plagued by fear and torment day by day. And here to anyone who, who has like that kind of day by day fear or even torment, here's what John is saying. The reason why you have this fear constantly in your life, this is what John is saying. It's because you're not growing in the love of God. Look what Romans chapter 8, 15 says. The spirit that you receive, this spirit that we have from God, the Holy Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. That's not God's will for you to live in fear. I looked up fear and I Googled like all the fear. There's so many fears today documented, like categorized fears. There's a fear of lack, the fear of death, 
the fear of loneliness, the fear of people, the fear of authority, the fear of commitment, heights, germs, closed in spaces, airplanes, dogs and cats, fear of failure, rejection, fear of being laughed at. There's even the fear of being attractive. What is that? And then, and then there are thousands of them, but check this out. There's even something called phobia phobia, which is the fear of being afraid, y'all. Can you believe this? I'm just convinced that this is, this is a, an attack of the enemy to have you live in a place of fear. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves to fear. Rather, the spirit you receive brought, brought about your adoption to sonship, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Listen, here's what you need to know. Fear is not from God. It's from Satan. It's not. When you're experiencing fear, what we need to understand is, is fear does not exist in the kingdom of God. It's not there. It is not in God's kingdom. Therefore, it should not be reigning or ruling in your life. Anytime there's fear, it's evidence that there's a stronghold somewhere in your life. Somewhere in your life, there is a stronghold when fear, it's so hard to detect sometimes, though, because fear does not manifest it as fear itself. Sometimes, some of you, you have anger problems and maybe outbursts, What really, you don't really have an anger problem, you have a fear stronghold. Beneath that anger, why you get so upset is you're afraid of losing something. You're afraid of something. Or maybe, um, for those of you guys in here, maybe you're driven and ambitious, maybe even a workaholic, and you might pride yourself on that, but that's nothing to be proud about, because underneath that is a fear, a fear of lack, a fear of losing control. There's a stronghold in our life. Underneath it all, listen, underneath all of that is a, a lack of confidence in God. That's what fear is. It's a lack of confidence in God. And this is how it is revealed, how walking in victory is revealed in our life. I am free and fearless. I have confidence in place of fear. 2 Timothy 1, 7 says it like this, for God has not given us the spirit of fear. That did not originate from heaven. That did not come from the throne room of God. He has not given us the spirit of fear. Here's what he's given us, power, love, and a sound mind. Fear is a tool of the enemy, of the devil, to keep you bound and miserable, to destroy God's purpose in your life. It'll begin as a thought, and then and then work on our emotions to get us to do things, or maybe even to not do things that we should do. Like the, We want to do the will of God, but fear keeps us from moving towards the will of God. So many people never fulfill the call of God on their life because every time they feel like stepping out in faith and, and doing the will of God, fear is there to say, no, 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 you shouldn't, no, no, oh, what if, and what if, and pull you back in, and never accomplishing the will of God. Is, is, is Satan using fear to stop you, to prevent you? Is because that's, I'm telling you, it's a tool of the enemy to keep you from walking in victory. Yet we have this in Romans chapter 8, the apostle Paul tells us this victory speech. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, persecution, famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Now we're going to face trials of all kinds. And he says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced. Somebody say, I am convinced. Okay, if you're going to walk in victory, you got to get convinced of some things, man. you got to get convinced. What are we convinced of? That there is nothing, neither death nor life, angels or demons, present or future, neither powers, height or depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is what victory looks like. God wants his children to live in an atmosphere of victory and confidence, an atmosphere of faith, and Satan would love for you to live in that atmosphere of fear and defeat. A growing confidence in God is the first evidence of us walking in victory. What's the second one? I'm glad you asked. Here it is. Number two. I have honesty in place of hiding. And this is really a byproduct of the first one, but let me read it to you in, in verse 20 and 21. He says, whoever claims, some of your translation says, if someone says, he says this like about seven times in his letter, and every time John says, whoever claims, or if someone says, what's followed by it is this this you know, encouragement to stop pretending. It's like, you know, a warning, stop pretending. Here's what he says. Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen can't love God whom they've not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. What is he talking about? He's talking about honesty. 
Honesty in place of hiding is intentionally followed after fear for him because it usually goes together. Fear, fear and hiding are pretense or like false projection, creating a false image of yourself. Those things often go together. In fact, they were born together in the Garden of Eden. Do you remember Adam and Eve? When, when they had sinned and guilt entered their conscience in their heart, they immediately tried to hide and cover up their nakedness, but there is no amount of covering or pretending that can shelter you from God's eyes. God sees it, and eventually Adam in Genesis 3 had to, had to say, okay, okay, God, I, 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 I heard you coming in the garden, and, and I was afraid, so I hid. And that's what happens every time. You're afraid, you hide, you pretend, you put on a mask, you act like things are not the way that they actually are. But when our hearts are confident before God, there's no need for hiding or pretending with God or with other people. See, a lack of confidence with God actually creates a lack of confidence with God's people. And that's actually part of the, the torment that fear produces, isn't it? It's this lack of confidence with people. It's like, what are they going to think, man? If they really saw, if they really knew, and, oh, what are they thinking about me? It's this, it's this fear that grips us. What do people actually think? This pastor asked me just recently, which, a question that I, I don't like. I, I don't like the question. It's, it's the wrong question, but... Anyway, sometimes pastors do this. They, they ask me, how many members you got over there? You know, which is the wrong question, you know, because it, it gets people comparing and stuff like that. And I don't, wanna, I don't want anyone comparing with us. But I, I was like, okay, well, maybe this can be a healthy thing. I'll be able to help this person out. And I said, well, we got like 1,500 members. There's about 2,400 people that come on a, on a Sunday, though. And he goes, man, that's a lot of people to, to try to please. I'm sure glad I don't have that problem. And like, he was trying to protect us. I don't know what he was doing. He was just like making himself feel better or something. I don't know, but. I said, I said, well, let me assure you, my friend, I've never tried to please not one of my members, okay? I try to please one person, the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Okay, I said, I said when, I, when I prioritize his voice in my life and his will in my life and his presence in my life, I'm confident that I am right with the people that I'm leading, okay? And, and so this is what, like, immature Christians and even immature leaders who aren't growing in the love of God they think they have to impress others with their spirituality, and they get stuck playing a role rather than living a life. Get stuck playing the role of a Christian than being a Christian. Get stuck playing the role of a good husband than living the life of a good husband. Pretending is one of the favorite activities of little children, but it's not one of the marks of maturity in an adult. It, it's... That, that mark of maturity is actually authentic. It's realness. It's, re it's, it's honesty. That's what's the real mark of a mature adult. Confidence toward God. Honesty toward God and others. Walking in victory. This is how it manifests. This is how it is revealed. Confidence. Honesty. Number three, check this out. It, it's revealed like this. I have joyful obedience in place of rule following. So rule, you know what rule following is? It's, it's okay, what else do I need to do? What else, what else do I, how can I get, how can I be better and be more holy and be, let me check it off and check off the list. And then what happens with that though is when we don't get to check off the list, when we miss a box, our world falls apart. We, still, we feel so far away from God. We're like, oh my God, I'm so terrible. I need to go repent again. Let me raise my hand. Pastor, pray for me. Can I get baptized again? Because I didn't even get saved. No, that's, that's, that's rule following. That what, what walking in victory looks like, it's not simply obedience, right? It's joyful obedience. Look what John says. We're in chapter 5 now. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the child. Oh, this is interesting. This is the first time he actually says it like this in verse 2. Okay, ch check it out. Look how, we, look how he says this. This is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God. For like four chapters, he's told us the opposite. He's told us, this is how we know we love God, by loving the children of God. And then he kind of flips it here. He goes, well, this is how we know we, know we love the children of God, by loving God. And, and it almost seems like a circular argument. Here John is trying to give us assurance that you know that you're saved. And it's like, okay, you just destroyed my assurance. Which, where, where does it start? Where does the assurance that I am his, and I'm born of God, and I have this love and this spirit. Where does the assurance come from? And it actually comes just right after what we're reading. Look what he says. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. 
Verse 3. In fact, this is love for God. This is what love for God looks like, to keep his commands. And then he adds this. And his commands are not burdensome. I don't know if some of you are like, yeah, right. Not burdensome. Are you? Here's, I'll, I've said it before and I'll say it again. You trying to fulfill the commands and the will of God apart from being born of God and having the spirit of God empowering and filling you is the hardest thing you're going to ever try to do in your entire life. John is talking about here. Here, let me kind of re-paraphrase what he's saying. He's saying, by this we know that we love the children of God when we keep God's commandments and don't experience them as a burden. This is the test of genuine love for the children of God. It's when you let the commandments of God govern your relationship to them and whether those commandments are actually a burden to you or a joy. Let me say it this way. Is serving God a duty for you or a delight? Okay, is, is this work to come to church and worship? Is, is that work or is it worship? Is it work to serve? Oh, man, I don't got time. I got, oh. Is it work to serve God or is it worship? Is it work to go to a small group and to be authentic and develop God-honoring brothers and sisters in Christ? Is that more work for you or is it worship? John is, again, pulling us back to what it means to be a true child of God. A true child of God does not experience the commands of God as rules but as joyful obedience. This is how we know, he says. You ever thought about this? Everything in all of creation, except for mankind, obeys the will of God and the commands of God. Everything bends to the command. Everything in all nature bends to the command of God. You can see it in the book of Jonah very clearly. In the book of Jonah, everything in that book is obeying the command of God except the prophet. The winds and the wave are obeying the commands of God. Even the fish is obeying the command of God, but not the prophet who's rebelling against God. Even, even the, the plant in the little worm is obeying the command of God, except for this prophet. See, disobedience to the will of God is a tragedy, but so is reluctant and grudging obedience. God does not just want you to obey him. He wants your heart. He doesn't want you to obey him out of fear or out of necessity. What Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, verse 7, it's about giving, but it's also about living. Look what he says. Each man should give what he's decided in his heart to give. He should not give wishing he could keep it. Oh, dang it, what I could do with that. All right, let me just, you know what I mean? And then he goes, or he should not give if he feels he has to give. God loves a man who gives not because he has to, but because he what? He wants to. This, this is what how we walk in victory. The victory is already yours, but what does it look like? How is it revealed in your life? Not just by following rules begrudgingly, but by joyfully obeying the commands of God. And then he summarizes it, and he says, okay, this is what victory looks like. When you have the victory... That actually overcomes the world. It, it's, it's a victory that overcomes, man. It's a victory that comes with power, that comes with results, that comes with the outcomes. Verse 4, for everyone born of God, meaning that you have God's divine nature inside of you. You're born of God. Overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one, look at this, who believes that's who overcomes. It's those who believe, who trust, who have faith that Jesus is the Son of God. This word overcome, in the Greek, it's Nike. It's Nike. That's what it is in the Greek. It's, it's, it's Nike. What he's saying is greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And we have to believe it because God said it. That's what this looks like. That's what walking in victory looks like. It doesn't, it's not circumstantial. I might not, it may not look like it, but God said it and I believe it. That's the victory that I'm called to walk in. There's this story of a guy named Jeffrey Clark. He was in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, an army specialist and supply clerk. Didn't have any like combat training per se, or definitely didn't have any um, like jumping out of airplane training, but he, he got this uh, letter from his commanding officers telling him to join the 82nd Airborne Division. 
So he gets this letter, immediately packs up his bags, jumps on a plane with a parachute, jumps out of this parachute, un, uh, this, this plane, unassisted, lands perfectly fine, and his officers are there on the ground. They meet him, and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. The, you, the letter went to the wrong person. It wasn't supposed to go to you. It was supposed to go to someone else. But we got to ask you a question. What in the world would it cause you to... to like, get a letter, and you were never trained for this. You, were like, you have no training to jump out of an airplane, yet what would cause you to do this? And he goes like this. This is a true story. He, he said this. He said, first, when you receive orders, you follow them. And then he says, secondly, secondly, he said, if the army tells me I'm qualified, he says, if the, I may not feel like I'm qualified, but if the army tells me I'm qualified, then I'm qualified. See, I need somebody to just hear me. You may not feel like you're qualified. You may not feel like you're an overcomer. But if God said you're an overcomer, then you are an overcomer. You just got to believe it. Oh, where did God say it? 1 John 5, 4. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. No weapon formed against me will prosper. Our victory is a result of this belief. We, we have faith. We trust in the Son of God. He said it. I believe it. Right? Here's, here's the, the challenge, though, what I found. I, I'm telling you, it's awfully hard to trust somebody like that that you don't know. See, if someone would come up to you later today, you're out at the restaurant or something like that, you're, you're going between your car and the restaurant, and some stranger comes up to you, he's like, hey, man, can I borrow 50 bucks? I'll meet you back here next week, same time. I promise I'll pay you back. Right? You're like, do I got stupid on my forehead? Dude, come on. Like, if you want 50 bucks, I'll give you 50 bucks, man. But, but don't tell me you're going to come... Yeah, like, I don't know you, man. right? But, but check it out. If, it's, if, if on the other hand, if it was someone that you, that you knew to be credible, dependable, faithful, reliable in your life, you know that person, and they came to you and said, hey, can I borrow 50 bucks? Man, I promise I got you back. If you had it, you give it no problem, right? Here, here's the difference. Your problem in trusting God is that you don't know him. You may know the Bible, but you don't know him. You may know the lyrics, but you don't know him. Because if you knew him, oh, you know he's dependable. You know he's faithful. You know he's, he's reliable. See, it's hard to trust somebody that you don't know. See, it's, it's, you can know the scriptures and miss it entirely. This is actually one of Jesus' complaints, his gripes, his, 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 his accusation against the religious leaders of his day was that they knew front and back the law and the scriptures, but they didn't know him. Look what John chapter 5, 39 says. He tells these religious people, he said, you search the scriptures because you think that they give you eternal life, but those scriptures were supposed to point to me. I mean, you, you made it a head knowledge thing that you put the word in your head, but those scriptures, they were supposed to reveal me, to know me, that we would build trust in a relationship that you can walk by faith in a victory. That's actually what Jesus was meaning when he, in Matthew chapter 11 when he said, look, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. Weary and burdened by what? By following the rules, by trying to make it happen, by obeying the religious rule. And, no, no, no. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And look what he says. And learn from me. This is what victory looks like. The victory that overcomes the world. It's one that believes. before it, it, it Believes because God said it, not because I see it. This is the victory. That's how it's revealed. It's manifested in our life in this way. I believe it because God said it. And then John closes the letter. We're going to close this letter, too, with these five certainties of the children of God. Like, like here, John wants you to be certain of some things, to be confident. There's that word again, right? To be confident in a few things. And it's not a self-confidence. It's a God confidence. First John chapter 5, verse 2. He says, by this we no. And again, 39 times the apostle John uses this phrase, we know, we know, we know, we know, we know. He's sowing into the church, we know. There's got to be some things you know, you know, you know. And it's not, again, it's not a pride thing. It's, it's, a, it's a God confidence. I know some things that keep me stable, that keep me sound. They're certain. I'm not going to be shaken from these things that we know. What are the five certainties that he ends with? Number one, he says, Jesus is God. 
This is a certainty that is unshakable. Remember, the, the, the reason, one of the reasons John's writing this letter is because there's false teachers. There were false teachers in his day trying to remove the divinity, the power of who Jesus was. And it might be not that a blatant today, but I think there's still people that call themselves Christian, but t- they treat Jesus like an addition to their life, like a good teacher or a good helper or motivational speaker or some, someone who can add value to your life. You need to know Jesus is God. He's Emmanuel. He is deserving of your worship, your awe, your reverence, your life. Jesus is God. In verse 6, he says, this is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. Really quickly, it's not in your notes, but what does this mean? The Spirit, the water, and the blood. Here's what it means. The water refers to the baptism of Jesus. That this was a confirmation of who he was. He's, the water, the blood was the cross of Jesus and the Spirit was, not, was two things. It's, it's the Spirit descended on him like a dove at baptism, but it's also the Spirit that was released at Pentecost into the church. Here's what he's saying. Through the water baptism, Jesus was, through the water, Jesus was identifying with humanity. Through the blood, Jesus was redeeming humanity. And through the Spirit, Jesus was recreating humanity. He was giving us a new identity, a new creation, born anew of the DNA of the Spirit of God. This is what he was doing. And the three are in agreement. Verse 9. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God, which he has given about his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts his testimony. Whoever does not believe, God has made him out to be a liar because they are not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. You cannot have, you cannot say you believe in God without believing in the Son. Jesus is God, this is a certainty of every child of God that we must rest on and come back to. Number two, the second certainty is this, that God wants you to have certainty that you have eternal life. He doesn't want you to live in fear or doubt or, or I wonder if, no. There's a certainty that we have eternal life. Verse 11, and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Think about that. There are those who do not have the Son of God, do not have Jesus. John is saying they're not living. They might be existing. They're breathing air on this earth, but that's not life. That's something else. Verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. As I was looking over this morning at this, um, I felt the Spirit of the Lord tell me, you know, Jason, everyone has eternal life. Everybody does. Before you think I'm a heretic teaching universalism or something like that, like everyone goes to heaven or something, here, listen to me. Everybody has eternal life. The Bible says that God has set eternity in the heart of man. Every single person has eternal life. Here's the question, though. Where is it going to be? Two places, heaven or hell. Yeah, before you thought that a big church can't teach hard things, this is the reality, right? There's two places, heaven or hell. And, and, and Jesus came so that you would not live a life separated from God, whether on earth or eternally in heaven. But it's more than just getting heaven. Because a lot of people want heaven, but they don't want Jesus. But you can't have heaven without Jesus. Through him, this is the certainty that in him we have eternal life. Not on your nose, but you remember John 10, 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. This is the life that God has given us. Life on this earth and eternal life in glory with him. This is a certainty that John is leaving us with. This is the gospel. Jesus is God. Okay? I have eternal life. Number three, be certain of this. God answers your prayers. There is a certainty for the child of God that he wants you to understand when you pray Things happen. Things are moving when the child of God, those who are born of him. Verse 14 says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything, key phrase, according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, 
we know that we have what we ask of him. See, the most important thing about prayer is the will of God. The first priority for you in prayer as you commune with God is to ascertain, to discern what is the will of God. That's the first priority for us to step into the presence of God, to pray and to discern what is God's will in this situation. It's the reason why Jesus gave us the Lord's Prayer. He included it in the Lord's Prayer. Remember in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, he says, pray like this, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, this is kind of difficult for some people to understand because I think some people think, well, if it's God's will for me to have a thing, why should I even have to pray for it if it's his will? Or they think like, well, why, do I, why would I even pray for anything else? Why don't I just pray, your will be done, God? According to your will, I mean, I'm just not going to. Here's why. Because prayer is the way God wants his children to get what he has prepared for him. Prayer is the only God-ordained method to get to your life all of the resources, promises, provisions, and blessings in the kingdom of heaven to your life. The only way you can access God's resources is through prayer. It's the only God-ordained method. Not whining, not crying, not nothing. It is prayer. That's it. And you say, well, I haven't seen that show up. My, I'm not experiencing that. Are you asking for you? Are, you? are you praying for it specifically? And I love what he says. Look how he says it. We know that we have. The tense he's using is so important, right? When we pray, he says, we know that we have what we ask of him. You know what this is? This is believing before receiving. That's what he's saying. You believe it before you receive it. Prayer is that thermometer of the spiritual life. It's not just the utterance of your lips. It's the, it's the desire of your heart. We don't pray to make us feel better. We pray because not only did God command it, but because it's the only God-ordained method to access the resources of the kingdom of God in my life. This is the way. I've been watching Mandalorian too much, you know. This is the way that God, and we're not beggars. Hey, we're not beggars. Hey, we're not coming to God like beggars. We are children of a very wealthy father who loves to bless us and to provide for us. God answers prayer. This you can be certain. Number four, certain number four. I, you, are not a slave to sin. You are not bound to the, to the flesh, to the world, or to the devil anymore. You do not have to obey the desires and the schemes of the world, your flesh, or the devil anymore. The shackles are broken. You are no longer a slave to sin. This is a certainty that we must live with as children of God. Verse 16. If you see, this is a very confusing passage for a lot of people. I'm going I'm to help kind of bring some clarity to this, this section. Here's what it says. If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death. Very confusing to a lot of people. A sin that does not lead to death. You should pray, and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. And people read that and go, oh my gosh, what's that one? I need to stay away from that sin. Okay, he's going to explain it in a moment. Let me show you. I'm not saying that you should even pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is a sin that does not lead to death. Verse 18. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. Therein lies the answer. What is the sin that leads to death? Here it is. It is the habitual, continual, continual practice of sin. That is the sin that leads to death. You probably may, might be familiar with it. When, when, you, when you do that thing or you go back to that place, you know that you should, and you, and you commit that sin, and, and there immediately is the sword of the Spirit dividing your, your soul and your spirit, the, and, and, and you sense the, the conviction of the Spirit of God, and you repent and cry, God, forgive me, I'm not, that's not me anymore, and then you go back to that vomit. And go back to that vomit again. Or back to the vomit again. And eventually, it's not a sword you're feeling anymore. It's a prick of a needle. And you keep going back to the vomit. Back to the vomit. And you don't even feel the prick of a needle anymore. You feel like a rub on your shoulder. You keep going back and you keep going back until you can't feel anything at all. That is the sin that leads to death. Where you are habitually, continually operating in sin. And you have no conviction. The Bible says that's the sin that leads to death. There is a sin that does not lead to death, he says. What's that sin? It's what we all do. 
We make the mistake, we do the sin, and the conviction of the Holy Spirit grips us and we repent and we say, God, forgive me. Here, he continues. The one who was born of God keeps them safe and the evil one cannot harm them. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Look, this is, this is a certainty that God wants you to understand that you have been transferred under the control of you used to be slaves of sin. Galatians says we are all prisoners. We were prisoners of sin. It's like we were in a cage of sin. And in this cage was this angry man shouting orders at us, barking at us to do, do what he pleased. And, and, and that, that angry man is called sin. You just have to obey. But what Jesus did is he transferred us from death to life. He moved us out of the cage. And that angry man still barks. You can still hear him, by the way. That sin, blah, 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 blah. and immediately you feel like obeying because that's what you used to do and that's what you know to do and that's oh I got and you feel like doing it immediately because that's what it's always it's always been but then you realize wait I'm not in the cage well I'm not a slave to that anymore well I've been I've been see knowing your disposition where you are in Christ is crucial to your identity in Christ you are no longer a slave to that sin. You have been free, set free from the bondage and the slavery of your flesh, of this world, and of the devil. Romans chapter 7, in verse 24 and 25, the apostle Paul is drawing on this, the reality of us hearing the angry man behind the cage and wanting to kind of do it, yet another part of us wanting to please God. And he kind of is, is showing the, the tension that even him and his apostle, every single one of us have. Look what he says. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Like I, I want to do, he, he says, I want to do the good and I don't do it. And the bad I want to do, that's what I continue to do. Is there no one who can do anything for me? See, you can pray in the cage. You can get an accountability partner in the cage. You can sing worship in the cage. You can go to a small group in the cage, but you're still in the cage. The question you should be asking is, who can rescue me from this cage? And the answer, he says, the answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. Come on, somebody give God some praise. Jesus can, he can, and he does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions. Where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but I'm pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. This is a reality. This is the war. There still is war to be fought. There is still a battle. We still have flesh, we still live in the world, and there still is a devil. But we are not fighting for victory, we're fighting from victory. I'm not a slave to sin anymore. That is a certainty that we must understand as children of God, part of your identity if you're going to walk in victory. And then lastly, number five, he says that the life in Christ that he's been preaching for five chapters is actually the real life. That outside of Christ, is, it's a hollow, phony. It's not, it's not, it's not your purpose. That's, it's not your destiny. It's not what God has created you for. Separated from him, outside of Christ, that's not living. It's dying. All right, let's close out our series, the last two verses. We know, too, that the Son of God has actually come into this world and has shown us the way to know the one who is true. We know that our real life is in the true one, his son, Jesus Christ. That's what real life, it's in him. There is no life outside of him. This is the real God, and this is the real eternal life. That word real, you know what it means? It means the original. This is the original plan. This is, this is what they were, you were always planned and destined to have life in Christ. The plan that we are Living apart from it, that's not God's plan for you. The original plan, not the copy, the original plan was for you to be born anew in Jesus. And then last verse, he says, so be on your guard. My dear children, against every false god, every other form of religion, every other gospel, any other Jesus that anyone preaches, any falsehood, be on your guard. See what a... A series like this does for us, to, to go through 1 John, what it's done for many of you is just to give you assurance and confirmation, like, it, like a sure footing, like I know who I am, that I have salvation not based on my feeling, but based on a fact. I, it's, it's, I, I don't go off of my feelings, it's not because who I am, it's because who he is. 
It's not because of what I've done. It's because of what he's done. So for some of you, you've been assured through this series. And for others of you, it may have confirmed that you don't know the Jesus that the Bible is talking about. That maybe you have a form of religion or rules that you try to follow. But this Jesus, this Jesus that changes, this Jesus that has power, this Jesus that, that puts a new DNA inside of you and recreates you. Maybe what it's done is confirm that, that you don't know that Jesus. And what I love about, about a series like this, you guys, is no matter whether you're, 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 it's confirming of who you are or, or, or who you're not, it all comes back to Jesus. That whether it's, it's confirmed who I am as a child of God or not, it all comes back to this is the gospel. Jesus is God. And in him, we have life. I don't have life apart from him. Not in myself, not by rules, not my own righteousness, but in him, coming back to this place. Every one, the, the, the Bible, or someone said that the footing at the cross is even. Can we all just come back together to this place at the cross of Jesus? Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.